Grab your Bibles, Joel chapter 2. I know where we're going tonight, and it is an exciting time in the Word of God. So let me welcome everybody. You look lovely tonight. I don't know what's going on with the traffic, but man, is it getting bad. Anybody been under the string bridge lately? Yeah, you're going to spend some time there. So leave early. Let me just welcome everybody also watching online tonight. We have a wonderful group online. We have uh, friends joining us from Austria, uh, Bhutan, Brazil, Canada, Finland, France, Germany, Guatemala, India, Indonesia, Ireland, Italy, Israel, of course, Malaysia, Malta, the Netherlands, the Philippines, Romania, Singapore, Slovakia, South Africa, Sweden, United Kingdom, United States, and we also have some friends in the house tonight from the Faroe Islands. So welcome everybody to King of Kings tonight. We're so happy uh, you are with us. What it means when we're talking about joining together in ministry, now you have to understand that Streams in the Desert is the southernmost ministry in the family now. So they are responsible for taking care of people in the south. We go all the way up to Haifa and now Benyamina. Let me tell you what's coming next week. Next week, we're going to introduce you to another brand new ministry in the King of Kings family. So come back next week. I'm going to let you know a little bit about what's happening in uh, Benyamina up in the north. That'll be a lot of fun. And then the last thing that we're going to be adding to our services in the coming weeks are some personal testimonies of God's power. Don't you want to hear that? Don't you want to hear of the testimonies that are what's really happening? We have several healings and miracles and breakthroughs that have happened over the last few weeks, and we're going to be bringing them up front. Uh, if we can make them courageous enough, we're going to bring them up front so that they can personally tell you that God is on the move, His Holy Spirit is real, His power is real, and it's active. It's not just something that used to happen, it happens today. Are you excited for that? Get some testimonies up here of God's power and His presence. Joel chapter 2. Let's continue in our series called The Road Ahead. Let me remind you why we are focusing on the book of Joel, because we realize in the age that we're in right now, we're going to need the power and presence and prophetic word of the Holy Spirit now more than ever. We will not be able to navigate the times ahead of us without the Holy Spirit discernment. We wanted to use the book of Joel to stir that up in us, to encourage us, to inspire us. And yet what we found was this idea that Joel is so famously known for, and I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. But that doesn't happen until the end of chapter two. And that famous verse about pouring out my spirit on all flesh, that verse begins with the word afterwards. Do you remember that from last week? Afterwards, I will pour out my spirit. So what we've been doing the last couple of weeks is studying the beforewords. We got to study something first before we can get to the afterwards. Last week, what we learned, and you can catch it on our archives, we learned that God is going to first cleanse his own house before he pours out his spirit, right? That was the first thing that has to happen before the outpouring. We studied the story of Jehu and Athaliah, the queen of Israel, Haziel, Joash, and, and, and that whole family drama and saga that happened and how God used it to cleanse his house first before the revival hit. And then later we're going to get the pouring out of the spirit, but we're not quite there yet. We're not quite to the part where God promises to pour out his spirit. So let's jump into the book of Joel chapter two. We're going to read a few main verses tonight, and then we're going to unpack these for just a few minutes. Joel two verse one. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. Like dawn spreading across the mountains, and a large and mighty army comes, such as never was in ancient times, nor ever will be in ages to come. I found that fascinating. One of my favorite things to do and we've talked about this before, is as we go through the scriptures and we come across those most famous verses, I love to make sure that we're reading them in context. How many of us have ever heard a song that is celebratory and it's upbeat and it's 
catchy and snappy. And it's like, blow the trumpet in Zion. And we're like, yeah, I'm into it. Woo! Let's blow some trumpets. But the context, do we really understand the context of that? You know, what we read, there's some key words in here about the context. You know, blow the trumpet because the land is going to tremble. It's a day of darkness and a day of gloom. Yeah. <laughs> blow that trumpet. Sounds a little different outside of the song, right? Sometimes I want to go back to the authors of those songs and be like, brother, sister, I think you have to make the mood of the song match the actual verse that it's going with. Song wouldn't be that exciting, right? Blow the trumpet in Zion, gloom and darkness. Nobody would sing that. But the context of the verse takes on a very serious tone. It's referring not to something celebratory, but to something that's awe-inspiring, something you need to be ready for, something you need to be on the lookout for, something that we should be in preparation for. Now, in biblical history, I think we all know this because we try to teach you this quite often, but what is the historical and biblical and prophetic significance of the blowing of the shofar, the blowing of the trumpet? Well, we know that we use it to call the people to war. When there was an invasion and we needed the army to assemble, we blow the trumpet so that the army would come get ready for war. We blow the trumpet to call to worship. It's very appropriate. Sometimes in our worship nights that we do midweek, we do them about once a quarter. And usually when we begin those worship nights, we blow the trumpet first. It's a call to worship. It's a call to assemble, come together. We have something important to talk about. It also declares the times, the months, the seasons, and the holidays. In this particular case, the blowing of the trumpet was a call to repentance. It's not the first time that we use the trumpet to call to repentance, is it? We use the trumpet to call to repentance on the Feast of Trumpets, don't we? It begins the 10 days of awe, the, the 10 days of repentance leading up to Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. So we have a precedent for using the trumpet as a call to repentance. Look back at verse 2 for a second. It's like dawn spreading across the mountains. A large and mighty army comes, such as never was in ancient times nor ever will be in ages to come. This is an army. And I was wondering, what, what does the army do? Like, I want to get to know this army a little bit more tonight. So I, I want to keep reading the next verse, verse 3. Before them, before the army, before them, fire devours Behind them, flames blaze. Before them, the land is like the Garden of Eden. Behind them, a desert waste. Nothing escapes them. They have the appearance of horses. They gallop along like cavalry. With a noise like that of chariots, they leap over the mountaintops like a crackling fire consuming stubble, like a mighty army drawn up for battle. So whatever this army is that we're about to talk about and describe, they're being described as looking like horses, looking like the cavalry or an army of horses and chariots. That's what the, the symbolism is. And you say, well, is it, is it realism or is it symbolism? Is it, is it like realistically happening or gonna happen or is it a prophetic symbol of something? Well, I think we get a little clue. Don't forget the duality of prophecy. Don't forget that. Lots of prophecies have duality. That means they're real in the day of the writing, but they're also prophetically coming to pass again in the future. And this may be one of those dual prophetic moments. What we know of is that a horse doesn't jump over a mountaintop, right? I've never seen a horse do that. So that might lean us to understand that part of this is a prophetic vision of the future. But at the same time, an army is an army. It, it comes and it really does fight, right? So we're going to learn a little bit more about this army and, and what it does. Before them or in front of them is fire, but so is behind them. 
is fire. Very important prophetic key to keep in mind because before we close our session tonight, I'm going to come back to that thought and I'm going to show you another army who had fire in front and behind them. Okay, it's not the only time this is used in the Bible, so keep that in mind. Now, this particular army that we're learning about isn't just symbolized by horses and chariots and a cavalry. They don't just jump over mountaintops, have fire in front and fire behind, but they appear to be a very disciplined army. Look down at the main text. Look at verse 6 now, Joel 2, verse 6. It says, At the sight of them, nations are in anguish. Every face turns pale. They charge like warriors. They scale walls like soldiers. They all march in line, not swerving from their course. They do not jostle each other. Each march is straight ahead. They plunge through defenses without breaking ranks. That is an army you want to be part of. That's a disciplined army that knows their purposes. Everybody knows their job. You know, it's important when you're part of a new covenant community like King of Kings that you know your role, you, you know your giftings and your callings and how you plug into the community and how we as a community then impact the greater neighborhoods around us. That's a great army to be part of, a disciplined army that doesn't break ranks, but they continue to do other things. Look at verse nine. They rush upon the city. They run along the wall. They climb into the houses like thieves. They enter through the windows. Before them, the earth shakes. The heavens tremble. The sun and moon are darkened and the stars no longer shine. So when you're saying, okay, is it realistic or is it more prophetic? Again, you're going to get a little bit of both because right here, when it starts to talk about the moon and the stars not shining, that's going to be a little bit more on the prophetic side than it is on, I've never seen an army that affected the moon, right? I'm just being very frank with you. So you're getting that duality of prophecy right here. So now it's a little bit of a strange army. We, we like the fact that it was the trumpet that called them, so that seemed positive, but then we didn't really like the fact that, that darkness and gloom comes with them. We like the fact that fire is before them and behind them. That seems pretty good. We like the fact that they're disciplined. They stay in their ranks and they fight with unity. We like that. But then there's these kind of strange verses. What are they doing? They're climbing walls. They're breaking into houses. They're like thieves through windows. What in the world? What kind of army is this? And this is where you have to read things in context, right? Because that's, that's kind of a strange thing to write about, especially if you're writing a song. I actually knew a song one time about that. They rush on the city. They run on the walls. Great is the army that carries out his word. Anybody ever heard that song? You know, they didn't, they didn't write the second verse of that. They're breaking into your house. They're breaking your windows. Verse two doesn't sell as well. But blow that trumpet in Zion. You know, there's like selective celebration in these verses. So what is going on here? Is it a physical army? Is it a prophetic army? Are humans involved? There's animals, there's chariots. The, the sheer size of the horses jumping over the mountains, it's, it's just got so much symbolism tied up in the reality here. And with all of this uncertainty, when we're looking at the, the images and the pictures and the depictions, how in the world are we supposed to know what the Bible is talking about? Well, you gotta keep reading and you gotta read things in context. Let's get down to verse 11. Kind of a, kind of a crucial verse tonight. Joel 2, verse 11. The Lord thunders at the head of this army. His forces are beyond number. And mighty is the army that obeys his command. The day of the Lord is great. It is dreadful. Who can endure it? Ah, so we finally get a little revelation. This army and all that it's doing is called the army of the Lord. This is not someone else's army. This is God doing this. And did you notice who was at the front of the army is Yeshua himself. So now we know that this army has universal impact. So now it's not just the realities of the present day. It's got to be something also into the future that we're supposed to look forward to. It carries that universal component of the Lord's army. 
This idea of the Lord having an army is very consistent in the scriptures as well. It describes his army under the Lord's command. I'll remind you of Joshua chapter five. Do you, you guys remember this? If you're, if you're new to the faith, maybe you don't know this story yet, but if you've been in the faith with us for a while, then you might know the story of Joshua chapter five. Let me read a few verses. Joshua 5, 13 through 15. This is where Joshua, the leader of Israel, and the leader of Israel's army has an encounter with someone. And it says, now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or are you for our enemies? Neither, the man replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord, capital L, does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Okay, so now we have consistency. There's an army that Yeshua leads. Now, how do you know it's Yeshua, Pastor Chad? Are, are you... You, you got to give us some evidence. How do I know that's Yeshua leading that army? Well, I'll give you two, two instances right here in this verse. First of all, when Joshua sees him, Joshua falls and bows to the ground. The Lord allows him to do it. In all other cases in the Bible, when an angel or a messenger of the Lord visits a person and that person tries to bow down, the angel says, get up. I'm not the Lord. But in this text, he allows Joshua to bow because in fact, it is the Lord. Secondly, when Joshua refers back to him and he says, what does my Lord require, capital L? The Lord just answers him. He doesn't correct him, right? It's not like he says, Lord, what would you have me do? And the messenger says, oh, excuse me, you got the wrong guy. It's not me, I'm just an angel. He says, no, I am the Lord. I will let you bow and I will answer your question. And so we know in those moments that is Yeshua. If you've never heard those messages before, when, when little baby Yeshua was born to Yosef and Miriam in Bethlehem, in Bethlehem, that was not the first time we've seen him. Right? We've taught you that many times. Maybe those of you watching online from abroad, maybe that was new to you, but that's not the first time Yeshua was ever seen. Yeshua has been seen seven or eight different times in the Tanakh. And this is one of the times he's leading his army. Back to Joel, he's leading his army. It's not even a new concept by the, by the time Joel sees it. It's something Joel would have already known about, that Yeshua leads his army. You guys have heard me preach quite often in the last few months because I want to make sure we as a kehila, as a congregation, that we are very clear on what and whom we are joining. When we say yes to Yeshua, he hands us a sword. It's called the sword of the spirit. And he hands us armor that we're supposed to put on. It's called the armor of God. And he enlists us in his army and then he lays out the blueprint of his upcoming battle, and he lays out the blueprint and the lies of the enemy's tactics. Look at the book of Revelation. So when you say yes to Yeshua, you have to know that you are saying yes to joining the army of God, and you will be dropped in the middle of a war. Please get this concept. Because if you don't get that concept, you will try to say yes to Yeshua with an emotional stimulus only. And the first time you hit rocky days and trials and tribulations, you will say, that is not what I signed up for. But if you heard the gospel correctly about repentance, life transformation, and joining the army of God and being a prayer warrior through these things, when times get hard and you are battling against the enemy, you're gonna say, that's exactly what Pastor Chad told me was gonna happen. And your confidence is still going to be high. Be careful how we preach the gospel these days. Yeshua allows Joshua to bow down. He allows him to address him as Lord, and he answers him as well. Did you notice that the Lord also told Joshua to take your sandals off? 
Take your sandals off, Joshua. This is holy ground. Well, the only other time we have take your sandals off, this is holy ground, is when God is talking to Moses. And so that's another, if you needed three points of validation, that this is Yeshua the Lord. It's holy ground when you stand in front of him. When we say yes to Yeshua, we say yes to enlisting in his army. So Joel talks about it. Joshua talks about it, but you know, Revelation talks about this as well. If you're making notes, Revelation 19, 11. It says, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and, and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven are following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. That's, that's the verse that stuck out to me when I came to faith in Yeshua. I don't know which Yeshua you met first. I mean, I realize there's only one but he shows up in different forms when you need him. He shows up in different attributes and, and introduces himself the way you need him most in that moment. But when I came to faith, that was the picture of Yeshua I got. That was the verse that was being read. So you have to understand as a new believer, my Yeshua has blazing fire in his eyes and he's on a horse and he's leading an army and he's got a sword. I'm like, that's the guy, I'm with him. Later, I learned about the gentleness of God and the mercy of God and the love of God. But at first, that's not the one I was following. I was following this one. And it's important that you know both. It's important that you know both. Because there will be moments when you're in a low position and you're broken and you're going to need that tender, gentle voice of God. Then there's going to be other Moments when you need to break the forces of evil and you're gonna be very glad you serve a savior that leads an army with fire in his eyes. Get to know all of the word of God. You know, the enemy also has an army, friends. And he's setting up to do battle against us and to fight against the Lord's army. Revelation 19, 19 even references this. It says, then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and against his army. So we know, we know when you say yes to Yeshua, you're engaged in a war. There's no doubt about that. Now I've shown you clearly from chapter two of Joel that the Lord's army is coming, it's on the way. It's symbol symbolically, it's represented by horses and chariots. Fire is before them and fire is behind them. But if you remember from last week, there was another army mentioned in chapter one of Joel. So if you turn back to Joel chapter one, look at verse six for just a moment, Joel 1, six. It says, a nation has invaded my land, a mighty army without number. It has the teeth of a lion, the fangs of a lioness. So we have to ask ourselves, are these the same army? It's like, is this the description, the same army, chapter one's chapter two? In chapter one, it's described as locusts that have teeth like lions. But in chapter two, it's described as the army of the Lord like horses and chariots. So it's two different kinds of descriptions of these armies. But the test of it is this, it's, the, it's right there in verse six. It says, a nation has invaded my land. It doesn't say that about the Lord's army. It doesn't, it doesn't say it's a nation, just calls it the Lord's army. But in chapter one, a nation has invaded my land with a large and mighty army. And it's important that we separate these two armies, chapter one and chapter two. Because as we noted, before the outpouring of the spirit can happen, much later in chapter two of Joel, we know that there's things we have to do first. The first is that God is gonna cleanse his house before the outpouring. The second thing is what we're teaching you tonight. The second thing that must happen first is that an army, a nation must invade the land. 
or at least attempt to invade the land. Cleansing of God's house and an invasion strategy must happen. Now, I think there's, again, some duality here. It happened in the past. It's prophesied of the future, but I think it physically is going to happen in the future. I think it's going to be attempted in the future. And Joel's not the only one who saw a vision like that. Let me turn your attention to Zechariah, the prophet. Now, remember, Joel is prophesying, and his ministry is in the same time as Elisha. So they're contemporaries of each other. They know one another. Elisha kind of is the, is the big name. Joel is the smaller name, but certainly they're in unison together. But, but Zechariah is another prophet who sees this. He sees this thing about the Lord's army. So I wanted to take you there. Zechariah chapter 12, if you're making notes. And let's do a little comparison between Joel chapter 2 and that army of the Lord and Zechariah 12 and the army that shows up here and what's going on. Zechariah 12, verse 1. A prophecy. The word of the Lord concerning Israel. The Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundation of the earth, and who forms the human spirit within a person, he declares, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. Judah will be besieged as well as Jerusalem. See, there's the invasion of the nation right there. On that day, when all the nations of the earth have gathered against her, I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. All who try to move it will injure themselves. Isn't that great? When an army tries to invade us, they injure themselves. Praise God. On that day, I will strike every horse with panic and its rider with madness, declares the Lord. I will keep a watchful eye over Judah, but I will blind all the horses of the nations. Then the clans of Judah will say in their hearts, the people of Jerusalem are strong because the Lord Almighty is their God. And on that day, I will make the clans of Judah like a fire pot in a wood pile, like a flaming torch among the sheaves. Did you catch that? Remember Joel chapter two, the army of the Lord, the Lord's out front and fire goes before them and fire is behind him. We get the same thing here in Zechariah, the army of the Lord with Yeshua out in front and they're being recognized by the fire all around them. Must be the same army. The Lord will save the dwellings of Judah first so that the honor of the house of David and of Jerusalem's inhabitants may not be greater than that of Judah. And on that day, the Lord will shield those who live in Jerusalem. Thank you for being here tonight. So that the feeblest among them will be like David and the house of David will be like God. Like the angel of the Lord going before them. Worship team, come on out. We want to remind ourselves of why we're studying this. We've shown you now in Joel that the Lord Yeshua leads an army. He is the commander of the army of hosts that Joshua saw. So we see it in Joel. We see it in Joshua. We see it in Zechariah. We see it in Revelation. And all of the armies look the same. And when you said yes to Yeshua, that's the army you joined. Your leader rides on a white horse. Not only that, your leader gives you a white horse. I don't know if you caught that. Anybody in the house ever wanted a horse? You're going to get one. You're going to get these fancy new clothes. You're going to get a white horse. You've already been given your sword, so that's already yours. You've already been given your armor. You're supposed to already be fighting. If we're the people of God and we are just passively sitting by and letting life move forward, hoping that we can find the most comfort for ourselves, what's the best job can I find? What's the most money I can make? What's the best house that I can buy? What's the biggest TV I can have? And what is my Netflix doing tonight? Then we've missed the whole point of why we enlisted into God's army. Friends, we're supposed to already be fighting. You say, Pastor Chad, why are you bringing this up? Don't don't give us a guilt trip. I'm not trying to give you a guilt trip. What I'm trying to do is get us to the end of Joel chapter 2 with the outpouring of the Spirit. It starts with the cleansing of the house of God and the engagement of God's family in battle. 
When we will allow God to cleanse his house and we will actively engage in warfare like we're supposed to, afterwards, my spirit will be poured out upon all flesh. But my spirit's not going to be poured out to a sinful, lazy, disengaged, numb body. Because that's not the body, that's not the bride that Yeshua left. He would not recognize some of this. The apostles would not even recognize some of the things we're doing right now around the world in the name of Yeshua. He wouldn't recognize it. There's way too much entertainment going on in the house of God and not enough engagement of warfare. Can I get an amen from anyone in the house? We are not here to impress you on Sundays. We are here to help you on Mondays. If you want that outpouring of the Spirit, then let's agree, let's unify that we are going to allow God to cleanse his house, starting with me, starting with you, starting with your family, starting with your community group, starting with the congregation, starting with the network of King of Kings and all its related partners. Let God's cleansing start in our house first. Then let's agree to engage in the battle we are supposed to already be engaged in. It's almost like saying, Lord, I want your army to come, but I don't want to be part of it. The problem is when you said yes, you were already supposed to be a part of it. And these are the two things that must first come and then afterwards, the outpouring of the Spirit. Let me close with our key phrase tonight. The great outpouring of the Holy Spirit happens afterwards, after the cleansing of God's house, after nations physically at least attempt to attack Israel, and then God's protection happens over his people. Let's pray into this. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your commitment to get us where you have called us. We thank you, Father, that, that we are enlisted, we are registered, we are actively involved in your army, in your fighting. And how do we do it? We fight the principalities and powers of darkness over the air. We fight not against flesh and blood, but against those principalities. We pray for Jerusalem. We pray for Judah. We pray for Israel. We pray for the nations. We pray for one another. We get on our knees. We don't neglect the meeting together of the body. We get together in our small groups and we are actively praying like warriors for what you want to do. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you for letting us be part of this family. Thank you for calling us forward. Thank you for giving us a sword and, and the armor and the blueprints of what you want to do, God. Father, we want to publicly commit to your plan. And we want to say, Holy Spirit, that you are welcome in this house. King of Kings, would you stand with me and just let's take a posture of welcoming the Holy Spirit for a moment. Whatever physical position you do to welcome the Holy Spirit, I want you to take that physical position because I want our outside to match our inside. I want us to be people that are genuine. My position is something like this, but that doesn't have to be your position. Holy Spirit, you are welcome into this house. Please come. Less of us, more of you. Less of our agenda, more of your agenda less of our ways and all of our modern strategies and a little bit more of, of just you and your universal wisdom. Less of our pretty programs, more of your real power. Thank you, God. Holy Spirit, you are welcome to come and cleanse this house and you are welcome to lead us in battle tonight in the name of Yeshua. We look forward to that outpouring, but we know that there's some alignment in our lives that needs to happen first. So we welcome you to do it. We don't fight against you tonight. Holy Spirit, when you whisper in our ear, we say yes. When you tap us on the shoulder, we say yes. When you convict us lovingly, we say yes. And when you correct us strongly, we say yes. Because we trust you. We trust the fire in your eyes.
we want to be part of what you're doing. We pray that in Yeshua's name. Hallelujah. Prayer team, if you would come on down. Some of you have been invited tonight specifically to come on down. You've been designated. Come on down to the front. What we want to do is, is this for a few minutes. If you could just stay engaged, stay connected. Our prayer team is going to come down. If you want to receive prayer, just come on and connect with them. The worship team is here. They're going to, they're going to play a soft song first to let us marinate in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Let that words get a deep seed root in us today. Okay, and the prayer team's gonna be ministering. After that, Pastor Mike's gonna uh, come and he's gonna close us officially. We're gonna leave you with celebration tonight. But for the next few minutes, if you could just honor the space, honor the house, what God's doing here today. Let's worship together and let the Holy Spirit continue to do his work tonight.